The selling beats versus placements thing. This is how it's going to, man. I hate to say this. Especially if you DJ in a popping club. Mm -hmm. You feel what I'm saying? This music business is work, 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 work. Big check. Uh, Gucci's rapping on the track right now. That's <laughs> what Yo, what's good? Welcome back to another episode of the Producer Grind Podcast. I'm your host, CEO Dylan. As always, letter L alongside me. What's good, fam? How you feeling today, bro? Feeling good, man. Feeling good, as I, always. I like that shirt, man. Oh, yeah. I appreciate you. Where you, where you get that from? Um... Urban Outfitters, shout out to Urban Outfitters, yeah. Death Row, who's your favorite Death Row rapper? Pop. I knew he was going to say Pop. <laughs> I'm still Snoop all day, every nah, day, bro. Snoop, yeah, I fuck with Snoop, yeah. Hell yeah, man, but uh, welcome into the show, man. And um, we got a very special guest with us today, man. Um, this guy is a platinum Grammy-nominated producer. He's worked with Migos, T.I., 21 Savage, Travis Scott, Jacquees, and T-Pain. Please welcome in the building, Daraj Global. Hey, yo, yo, what is good with you, bro? How you feeling, fam? Feeling great today, man. Excited to be on the show. Appreciate you battling through that traffic to uh, to come see us, man. Yeah, yeah, it's all good. I was asking, you said you're from Louisiana, right? I'm from New Orleans, yeah. You're from New Orleans, and uh, you said the traffic's not as bad there as it is in nah, Atlanta? Nah, nah. <laughs> not at all. It's too small. <laughs> it's too small. <laughs> oh, you was worried about, man, when I go back, man, that brush shower is going to be. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, man, Daraj, man, um, appreciate you being here, man. And, and for those who aren't familiar with your story, who may only know um, the placements, man, and, and you've got some big ones. How did you get your start? How did you get into the game? Um, well, I'm going to just go all the way back. Uh, I'm originally a keyboard player. Like, I was brought up in church. So I uh, play keyboard, organ, uh, drums, and everything. And pretty much, I started a record label in New Orleans around 2006. Right. And I pretty much work with everybody I could work with. So it was like, in New Orleans, it's like once you reach a point, you don't go no further unless yeah. you move out of New Orleans. Yeah. So I had reached that point. And um, the first person to give me a chance was actually Lil Scrappy. And um, I worked with him along with Young Jock. They were actually the first two people like give me a chance Word. out here in Atlanta. Word. Yeah. And that was doing kind of their heyday too, right? Well, Scrappy was, yeah. 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 <laughs> And so kind of now to, um, you know, as I kind of did my research um, most recently, the really big thing for you is, is the Migos one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, Migos and Travis Scott record, uh, Kelly Price. Um, that was a real big record for oh, me. That's dope. That was on the first, uh, what is it? Culture. Culture, album. Culture yeah. 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 And so that earned you a, my bad, y'all. They'll get it in post. That earned you a. Um, Grammy nomination, right? Yes. So can you talk about the process of being a part of that album, kind of how you got into the studio, how you link with them, um, how you got the concept off and everything like that? So for that particular record, uh, me and my brother Cash Clay Beats actually did that record together. Bl okay. bl blood Brother? Well, not my blood. That's brother. Your, oh, okay. I was going to say. Like, it's like, uh, yeah. Yeah. But um, we actually just sent it out to Quavo, and uh, we didn't know it made the album until actually the day it came out. Oh, word! <laughs> yeah. Get out of here, bro. And that was like it was it was like this like December, January type. January twenty seventh. That's a hell of a New Year's <laughs> gift, man. It was. It I'll really take was. that one. What was your first reaction when you seen like, oh shit, this is my shit? What were you were you playing it? Like, how did you find out? Uh, somebody told me, and I listened to it, and uh, I stood in believe. I was like, did somebody remake the beat? Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and but yeah, it was it was surreal. But you got paid, right? Of course. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> still, actually, still getting paid. I still get publishing checks. Bruh, you're going to be eating off yeah. that one for a while, probably. Well, well, hold on real quick. You know, for the producers, you know, a lot of producers ask us about publishing. What do you have to do to get your publishing in order to make sure you were getting that? That's that. a good question, man. So, the great thing about me, I got screwed when I first moved to Atlanta. I actually signed a five year contract to somebody, and I actually got to learn about publishing and contracts and everything during that process. Mm hmm. And um, that was around 2008, 2009. So um, I know all about publishing. So what I do now, as soon as I heard the song, I literally, I had already copyrighted the beat, but I literally published it. They hadn't did it yet. The Migos hadn't even done it yet. I literally did all the publishing myself on mm -hmm. that song. So I actually registered that record. Yeah. Well, I'm BMI, ask Kat. BMI. BMI. Yeah. And then what you do, you just log in. Log in, put in my credentials. I put in Migo. I didn't know what their stuff was, but I literally just split 
theirs and Travis Scott's and put it in there. It really, when you register a song, it really doesn't matter about the other person just as long as your inf- information is right. The yeah. other people go in and change Do whatever they need. Yeah. So that's exactly what happened. I put my info in. I put my brother Cash Clay info in. Yeah. And eventually they figured out the rest by, the, you know, by themselves. Got you. Now, now you said you had signed a bad deal. Yeah. Um, you know, for the producers out here that, you know, may may have offers on the on the table for deals like that. What does a bad deal look like? All right. So with my deal, I actually started off as an artist. So with my deal, it was an artist, but I was making all my own beats. Mm. And um You're pretty singing much or rapping. Huh? You were singing or rapping or both. Okay. So pretty much um uh, with me, uh, a bad deal is just I didn't get no money up front, then I sold over Half of my publishing, the guy, the guy that I signed to, he owned half of my publishing. He was my manager, so he owned fifty of that. Then twenty percent of my management and me as an artist, he had a percentage of that too. So I probably had like fifteen, twenty percent of whatever I made. Damn, good God! But I was able to get out of it. <laughs> so what did you do? Did you like? Were you putting out records consistently, or did you just kind of wait it out? Because it seems like. A lot of artists, you know, in the industry that are in bad situations, it seems like they're waiting out, like Wayne, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I didn't wait it out. I ain't, I, ain't, I ain't wait it out. And uh, me just coming from New Orleans, I had a rough background already, so I didn't want to handle it the wrong way. So yeah. I, I actually, being out here in Atlanta taught me how to be more of a businessman. Okay. So I was, I, I literally hired an attorney to get it right. Got you. Yeah. That's what's up, fam. So, <clears throat> and I'm glad you're able to drop that knowledge, man, because I feel like we got a lot of people who run out here who are very talented, right? And aren't really taking care of their business. And one of the reasons right. they simply just don't know. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So that's one of the reasons we ask you all these types of questions. So in this current climate, you know, in addition to taking care of your business and your publishing, right? Um, what do artists need to know about uh, getting a placement? Artists? Excuse me. And uh, uh, Rather, what do producers need to know about getting a placement with an artist? I'm sorry. So pretty much all my placements that I've ever gotten has pretty much just kind of fell in my lap. I'm the type of guy, like, I believe in law of attraction. I believe in speaking things into existence. And that's literally what I did with every placement I've ever had. I never tried to get a placement. Yeah. I just work. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. like, you know, uh, DJs, like, coalition, like, I, I hang around, like, a lot of DJs or people that's around independent artists. I hang around those guys because those guys – the artists that's coming up are always around them first, yeah. and then they come up. You know what I mean? So, that's- so, so we had bumped into you at uh, a coalition DJ event over at right. Stank on his Studios, right? And so you were talking a little bit about your relationship with them and yeah. how that's kind of served you through the years. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I met DJ Funky probably back in, I don't know, man, but it was back when I was an artist. And I used to bring my songs up to Strokers, and... He he was pretty much the only person that was playing them. Like yeah, he would play yeah, the songs, yeah. and we built a relationship from there. And um, I left it alone for a while, being an artist, and then I came back as a producer because everybody always loved my beats. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when I did that, he said, "Let's do an album together." So we did our first album called Underground Hype, and we've done three more Underground Hype since that one. So that's pretty much how my relationship started with the coalition. And so you have experience putting out your own music. Yeah, I've been putting out my own music for a while. As a producer, too. Yeah, and I, I also help other people to put out, like Funky, I help him put out his music. Right. And so, you know, here's a common thing we, we kind of talk about on the show is like uh, what, what Dylan calls a DJ Khaled model, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, which, huh? No, nah, go ahead. No, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, well, you, you talk about it all the time. Go ahead and explain that, you know, to the people. Oh, I mean, you know, I just encourage rappers, you know, to take it more into their own hands and put out projects, you know, themselves, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, whether it's working with a relationship, you have relationships with artists. Mm-hmm. And so, like, hey, bro, you know, instead of paying me for this beat, why don't you shoot me a verse or a hook or something like that? Or even flat out paying for it, you know what I mean? And right. So, and so you're somebody that has experience doing that. So, one mm-hmm. of the things that we have, we have our, in our audience a lot of producers who are putting out their own music. They're going to get the artists, they're going to put in the mm-hmm. pieces together, right? So, when you have that, a lot of times you have a limited budget, right? Mm-hmm. So, when you're putting out your own music, what are some of the smartest ways to use a budget, whether it be in terms of features, promotion, studio time, et cetera? What can you talk about that? I, honestly, all the records I put out, it never, it's never really been a, a budget at all. I normally just put it out and normally I work with artists that already kind of have a buzz. <clears throat> so it just kind of carries from there. Like even the stuff that me and Funky put out, we always, that's why we call it the underground hype. It's like we always get the artists that already kind of have a buzz. So yeah. when we put it out, we just put it out and they pretty much go and they push it. Especially if we shoot a video phone, like, you know what I'm saying? Because I, I shoot video and stuff too, I direct. So it's like, that's we'll dope. give them this full, that's dope. Yeah, we'll give them the full package and all they got to do is go out and push it. That's it. So talk about that. So how is, you know, has, has being a video man, you know, led you to situations where you're getting 
you know, placements or, nah, or money nah, off beats? Nah. Because normally all the people that like I direct videos for is normally my clients that have bought beats from me. Gotcha. You get what I'm saying? So, um, but yeah, I can't say it brought me any placements. But it still made you additional money because you wouldn't have made of that Of course, money. of course, of yeah. course. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's like, if I'm already in the studio, like let's say I'm in the <clears> studio <throat> with an artist, like the first thing uh, artists pretty much want to do after they shoot, they want to shoot the video after they do the song. So they'll ask me, well, who shoots? And I'm able to say, well, I... You get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I'm able to show them some of my work. So I kind of get first dibs sometime before, you know what I mean? For the I, pro- for the producers out there, would you recommend, you know, and it, if, if you don't have a passion for it, would you recommend them picking up a camera and trying to learn it as a business move? <sighs> Only if they're going to go all the way and really learn it. Because I, I think it's kind of unfair um, right now because anybody could just pick up a camera and just start using it. Mm-hmm. But I, people go to school and actually learn how to do, you know, the ISOs and the apertures and all that. Like with me, I literally took maybe six months and learned everything. I, YouTube was my teacher. Yeah. But I think it's kind of unfair. I, I can't say only if they're going to really do the research and actually find out what everything does, how to work things, yeah. what's the right lenses to use, you know. Yes, if they do that. <laughs> or would you say that six months of learning is it is it better spent do towards that, or would you say it's better spent towards put just putting that into your beats, like for someone? That's what I'm saying. See, me the only reason why I got into it, just like I do mixing and mastering, and it's like I do everything right. But it's like with me, I'm a hustler. Like like I said, I'm from New Orleans, so it's like I always hustle. And I always wanted to do things the right way, make money legally. So mm-hmm. the reason why I went into doing all these different things because I always wanted to make money the right way. So I only suggest people that really have that hustler mentality to do it. But just don't do it just because you feel like it's another check. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. You consider yourself more of an artist or entrepreneur? Entrepreneur, definitely. Mm. Even more than music. Mm. Mm. Yeah. What? Why? I mean, I guess, I guess, in in my own mind, I can fathom why, right? But I you guess. you start off as a little kid I can tell you why. Keys. Yeah. All right. So even in church, like when I was playing keys, like uh, they were playing me, they were paying me a good amount of money to play keys. But when I moved to Atlanta, it was a different world for me. Like just being around Scrappy and like. Uh, if, if we go to like Blue Flame or something like that, they throwing ten, twenty thousand dollars. I want to do that too. So <laughs> my first couple of placements, I literally blew all my money. Yeah. So it was like it, it's fast money with with the music too. Like you know, I might get twenty, thirty thousand for a beat, and it's like you can spend that in a day. You yeah. feel what I'm saying? So yeah. what I learned was, I guess in the last four or five years, every time I make money from publishing. Uh, make money from a beat up front. I either put it into real estate, and I got several other business. Like, you know, yeah, what I mean, I, I'm yeah. into putting money into business, yeah. and that makes me money. So I have my freedom. I don't have right. to feel like I have to work. I don't have to work every day. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm kind of more comfortable. So I, I suggest anybody that's doing music, just make it. It's my passion. I do it for the love. It's not for the money. Because when you switch over to just doing it for the passion, some people you're not gonna work with, and some people some money you're not gonna take from certain people. Because you, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You, you, we do it for the wrong reason sometimes when we, we need money. That's you real shit. I mean? That's real shit. Bro, you just dropped a lot of jewels in the last couple, because I want to double back for a second. Okay. Um, so the camera stuff, right? So you're talking about don't just do it because it's going to be another check, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and I agree with you, right? Mm-hmm. But I watch people, because we give people this advice all the time. We're like, hey, if you do something else, you need to exploit that or mm-hmm. learn something else, right? Mm-hmm. And so, like you said, just, just the thing you point out was like taking the time to learn your craft, right? And so we have a whole slew of video editors and I'm laughing because when you said ISO, Semo was just getting on me about the ISO, like, bro, like, don't just look at it by the thing, know your numbers, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. And all that stuff matters, like, because you be looking at people, man, man, your stuff is really crisp, you're yeah, really clean, yeah, yeah. how did you do that? Yeah. Go learn something. Exactly. So like, even with me, it's like, I just got my first video shot by this guy named KD Gray. Mm-hmm. And what KD did, um, I think we did two videos together. And I was watching him, I was like, man, I was intrigued by how he was doing it. So from there, I started working with artists like on production side, and they would ask me about videos. So what I did, I started directing videos with him. And I would get money from doing that. And then after that, I went and bought a camera. Mm-hmm. And I was doing the camera and directing at the same time. But now I'm to the point where it's like, it takes a team. Like you get a lighting guy, you get a camera guy. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm. It takes a whole bunch. It takes a team of people to make a make a full production. Yeah. That's what I've learned. Over yeah. the time. That's why I say don't just get into it just because, you know what I mean? It's one of those things where like you think you're dope until you see somebody really doing it. Exactly. 
You know what I mean? So, yeah. so hell yeah, man. That's dope to find out you're a videographer, man, because that's what we do here. We make beats okay. and we do videos, man. So that's okay. dope. All right, bruh. So, um, yeah, I see y'all got the black magic over there. Yeah, oh, so you know what the camera is, man. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I know about it. I'm 86 right <laughs> What do you use? Right? Real cameraman. What's yeah, your, huh? What, what's your oh, main camera? Red. Huh? Red. Oh, okay. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Are you on a red? I do not own a oh, red. Oh, okay. I do not. It's either we rent it or I get a, a, a camera guy that I already had. Hell, no, I was, <laughs> was going to be like, hey, bro, we need to chop it up. Yeah, you know, yeah, we yeah. Need, <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what we do here, man. But um, we got a couple segments. Uh, We're going to segue into the next part of the show. Um, We got overrated, underrated. And we got the um factor. I'm actually looking forward to this um factor. So um, we don't get you on overrated, underrated first. <clears throat> we got five topics. We ask you about them. You simply respond overrated or underrated. And if we feel right. that something requires an explanation, <laughs> we will ask you for one. <laughs> so overrated, underrated with Diraj Global. Here we go. Overrated, underrated. And you kind of touched on this a little bit already. Major label deals for producers. Overrated. Mm. Okay. What's the main reason why? Why I feel like it's overrated? It's just I'm just speaking of my experiences with my friends that have signed major deals. They're not happy. That's, that's what it's that's it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just really that simple. I get the same vibe from people too. Man. Yeah. Can you? It's a man. It's a facade, man. Like what I learned about living out here. Everybody, it's a facade with everything, man. Like people go out and buy cars that they can't afford. They yeah. go buy jewelry that they can't. Like you see, man. I'm like the bro. I don't care if I got 30 million in the bank, bro. I'm derived global. I'm not wearing all that shit. Like, even this, this watch right here, my girl bought me this, man. My girl bought me this three years ago. I ain't never watch, bought bro. another watch, bro. Never bought another nah, watch. No, when I got to Atlanta, I realized, like, capping is like a sport. Man, look. They take it to a whole nother level. Like, man, <laughs> artists in the studio, they'll talk about how much money they got and can't pay $50 an hour for studio time, or they can't get their song mixed. They can't pay for the video. Yeah. You know, but they got all this money. They always flashing on, you know, Instagram or whatever, so... That's why, man. It's just people. Just it's not so, a lot of stuff is not real. So, what you think? What's the what's the whole catch with you know the producer deals? Is it the fact that for a lot of these guys, this is the first real money they're ever seeing? So yeah. they're like, oh, I think I think that's it. what it is. They're like running. Yeah, I think that's what it is. And then they later learn because they don't even look at the contract because that's what I did when I first got. So I even know it was an artist contract. It's like they see the money, but they don't understand what they signing off. Everything they signing their masters, they signing everything off, yeah. and then a lot of them might get in a deal where it might be a ten a ten beat deal. That ten beats might take you eight years, and you're not getting out of there until you give them that. Mm. And it might ha- those ten songs might have to be on Billboard each one of them, or it don't mm. count. Mm. You know what oh, I'm saying? Wow. So like this is the type of deals people get. Yeah. It's just not it's not worth it in my yeah. in my opinion. Now you know it just. It's all about security. Just like if you work a nine to five, it's security. You know you're getting a check. Me, it's like I'm on of a hustler. Like I rather grind hard. Like right now, I still grind hard. I still give out free beats sometimes. I still, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just because it's like it's it's the ultimate. Like, like I said, I take my money and I put it into businesses. It's all about being an entrepreneur. So the safe route. So to me, a deal is like getting a nine to five. That's just my opinion. People gonna hate me for it. It's my opinion. Mm. <laughs> wow. Okay. That makes sense though. Yeah. Overrated, underrated, adding hooks to your beats. Overrated? <laughs> I know you have an answer. Wow, yeah, no, I was, I, okay, yeah, explain that one. Again, man, it's like, I mean, most of the, I don't know, maybe it's just the artists I work with, like, they just want to do their own thing. I just let them go in there and do their own, I'm, I'm the type of producer, I, I don't really play beats. Yeah. When we get in the studio, I'm making something from scratch. Yeah. Like we're gonna sit, we're gonna ride together. And most of the time, within the first 15, 30 minutes, they didn't got already got their hook already done. And yeah. uh, another thing that made me feel like it's overrated is cause I came in when people were when the writers were really, really big. So I did a lot of songs with writers and they never did nothing. Mm. So most of my songs was just in there with the artists on the spot, boom. And I'm looking at the list we read off to at the beginning, right? So, T Pain, does T Pain write? Of course. Okay. And then there's Jacquees right? A little bit. Right. But then you got Travis Scott, 21, Migos, yeah. and T.I. They don't really write. They're kind of known for they, like not writing. They just go in there and do their thing. So, when you're working with a lot of artists like that, maybe doing the hook maybe isn't a good thing. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just like, I mean, even with Jacquees, like yeah. the record I did with Jacquees, um, Brian from Jagged Edge wrote his verse. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, I think writers are still cool, but it, it has to be in a moment yeah. for me. Because I'm yeah. not about to sit, sit there and 
make a bunch of beats and try to go find people to do it. How long does it take you to cook up when you're in there with them? 20 minutes, 30 minutes tops. I'm I'm a I'm a producer. Like if you go back and listen to my beats, like when I first started, like I said, I come from church, so my beats had 30 instruments in them. <laughs> you yeah. know, I just went crazy. Yeah. But now one or two songs, that's it. Because that's all they want. <laughs> that's what it is. Uh overrated, underrated, selling beats online. Overrated for me. Man, go ahead and explain that one, man. Cause, cause and I only say that because so, what you just explained, you, you're a guy that has a lot of sources of income, right? So I would think that that would be one of the things you would do. That's okay. So I when I started out again, I was putting beats on like SoundCloud, sound click, sound yeah. click, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. sound click, yeah. yeah. So I did that, but it like shit, I like forty dollars. People were leasing, like nobody was buying them. Like I said again, I could get twenty grand for a track right now. Yeah. Why would I put fifty dollar beat leases? And I feel like. To me, it made me look small. Still, right now, you can get twenty. Yeah, of course, of course. That's see, that's the whole point in not not doing shit with everybody. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Right. And then not having my beats so accessible. Like you'll never, nobody has my beats in the email. I don't send beats. I don't do that. I don't care if it's tip or whoever. Like they pull up on me and we work, or I pull up on them and we work. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah. So I was like, I don't believe in the whole putting the beats on the internet. I just don't do it. So as a as a as a producer, you know, just trying to get started, you don't have relationships, and you have that mindset. What's what are some of those first steps to get in the studio with those artists? Go to open mics and just give mm. to all the up and comers. Give, that's it. And I still do that to this day. Like every, like I got I literally got five uh, sessions this week where I saw some new artists that's popping. I'm working with all of them for free. I give them three hours of studio time for free. Anything after that, sixty dollars an hour. It, and most of them knock it out within an hour. Right. <laughs> and we just in and out. And that's kind of smart because now you're building up more clients for your studio time right. and everything. You know, right. I mean? It's just like the entrepreneur thing. Like whatever you, whenever you start a business, like you work hard as hell in the beginning. Like you build, you build, and you keep building until you don't have to do nothing no more. Mm-hmm. So everything, everything is pretty much passive income after that. Mm. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So like, even if I have one hit, if I have one hit a year, that pays out everything for me. Mm. Cause publishing out, it pay off everything. I only need one hit a year. I'm not worried about, you know, just going and trying, just rushing, trying to get this and do that. No, it's all about quality for me. You know what I mean? Mm. So just like the record me, uh, T.I. and Jacquees got out right now. We did that song back August last year. Now we just shot the video maybe a week or two ago. You shot the video? No, I did not. Really? Actually, uh, it was Marco Diamond, Joe Young Spike, and Juice Big Fella. They all did it together. Mm. And um, that was an experience too, having those three different directors and then they had like three different lighting crews. I had never experienced so many different people mm. on one set. Yeah. That was different. But um, yeah, getting back to the point is like, it's all about quality with me. And um, shit, we could write that one song for two, three years and we just get, you know what I'm saying? We're just getting paid. All of us happy, you know? Mm-hmm. That's what it is, man. All right. Uh, overrated, underrated, J. Cole. Underrated. <laughs> What'd you think of KOD? I, I, I ain't heard of KOD yet. I just, just from past, like I always didn't understand why he wasn't doing it. Mm. I haven't listened to KOD yet. But I've been hearing mixed reviews. And he seems like the type of artist that would be perfect for a producer like you. You know what I mean? That has that. But that... see, he do, from what I mean, he do everything himself. He making beats and everything. Oh, damn. Yeah. That's what it is. Anything sound radio on the, on the KOD to you? I was trying to pick one out, but I couldn't really. A little bit, cause he has like a slight emo streak in some of the mm. some of the records. I mean, that's just my opinion. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It has like a like a little emo tinge to it, and that's the only reason I could hear on the radio. I mean, ATM they were bumping that during the playoffs, like oh, every really? commercial break. Yeah, mm, that might be the one. Then. Yeah. See that type of stuff too, man. What I've been learning, like um, commercials and television, licensing. And yeah, man, that money is so different than rent money. Better, can, huh? Better, way better. What can you tell? Like, can you? I, yeah, I could tell one, and I'm going to say this, and I might get in trouble, but I'm going to tell y'all about a situation I had two years ago. There was a show called Frankie and Nephew. Yeah. Y'all remember that show? Ain't he's that, cold he's mama, called Mama, like, yeah. All right, so, and uh, I love you, Elite Noel. I love all y'all, but look, I'm going to tell y'all straight up what happened. So I did a record with Elite, and that's Keisha Cole's sister. Mm-hmm. And um, she had a writer. I ain't going to bring up no names. But anyway, did a record with her. A month later... I'm at home, my girl screaming my name. Like, what's up? She was like, that's your song, that's your song? What you talking about? They had put the song 
as the intro for the show. Mm. It was the literally the intro. So it came on every day. Mm. Okay. So me being going through all the stuff that I've been through, um, my first thing is I let it ride. Do y'all understand why? Nah, why? Well. Okay. So you could do this thing in the industry called a cease and desist. You heard it? Yeah. yeah. So pretty much with that, you pretty much cutting off the song. They can't play it no more. It got it got it has to get stripped yeah. off the end or whatever. What I've learned is when you let a, a, a record or whatever go all the way through and make as much money as it can, you then collect and you take all of that money. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So it's called a copyright infringement. Mm. All right. That's what it's called. It's called copyright infringement. So pretty much that's what happened with that record. My copyright was infringed on because that was my track. I did not give no permission. I didn't sign off. Because mm. anything on TV, you have to sign off for that. Mm. I didn't sign off for nothing. So what I did, I waited till the last season went off. And then I quietly and calmly contacted BET. They then switched me over to Viacom because Viacom owned BET. And they cut me the fattest check I've seen in a long time to mm. shut up. <laughs> <Pretty much. laughs> How many seasons was it? I don't even remember. But I, I don't remember. Was it more than two? I can't remember. Like, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to think of how long you had to sit on this. <laughs> it, I sat on it for about a year. Okay. Like, about a year. So, yeah, but they cut me that and I got to take 50% of all the publishing money from it on top of the check that they had to cut me. That's dope. So they cut your check just not to Take it through to take it to yeah, court. They didn't oh, want me to take God. it to court. If no I would have took it to court, it would have been stupid. It was, but it would have been an investment too on your part too. Uh, and a risk, a little bit of a risk. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think um, a risk. Because there's always a chance that they got a better lawyer or whatever. Then you know, it wouldn't I mean? have been a risk. You don't think so? Because the reason why it wrong. wouldn't have been a risk because every time I leave the studio, I literally copyright the record song we leave. I copyright the record before the artist copyright. And how do you do that? Go to copyright copyright.gov and you put it in the system. Mm. It's really that simple. You have a very melodic background. Last yeah. overrated, underrated. Trap soul as a genre. Man, can you explain to me what trap soul is, please? Or give me a song that's trap soul. I don't know. Bryson Tiller. That's why. I, I, I like it stuff, but I'm not black, a fan. Black, that's a good one. Black. I don't know who that is. I'm not you know black kill me about that. I don't know who that is. But to be honest, bro, I'm not really a person that even listen to the radio or, or keep up with what's going on. I just kind of like, <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm just more of an entrepreneur. I love music, but I, I don't just sit around listening to music all yeah. day long. You get what I'm saying? It just. I don't know. But I don't know who Black is. And plus, when you've been doing it as long as you and you're so good and you've internalized it, once you have that skill developed, it it, it just seems like it's not as important. Not, not that it's well, not important, but it's kind of like you've compartmentalized it. So when it's time to well, make yeah, beats, you what just What I learned with is important, though, no, I have to keep working with these kids, man. Like, you see, like I keep working with like 16, 17, 18 year olds because they're the ones that keep me relevant. Right. If, I, if I was not listening to music and, and not working with them, I wouldn't be able to be out the loop. Yeah, I would be all the way out. But since I continue, I just keep reaching out to them because they the future. So I, I keep reaching out to the young kids. Right. And um, that's the only thing that keeps me like. So I wouldn't ask to say like I don't just like purposely, but it's just yeah. kids would keep me. You know what I mean? Well, and it answers a question I was gonna ask earlier, but we got away from it. Was you talked about you always end up working with artists that are already buzzing. Mm -hmm. And you kind of answered it. You go into those uh, open mics and mm -hmm. you're reaching out to to those young kids. A lot of times, those teenagers are the ones that really had the big social media presence. Because I remember 21 before he blew up. I remember me going for Like, the people I'm working with, like, it wasn't so... The only people, like, all right, like a T.I. maybe or... Uh, um, who else you say? Um, T-Pain or something like that. You know, uh -huh. like, they more veterans. Uh -huh. So I was kind of like... I actually listened to them growing up. So with them, I was kind of more like, damn, I'm I'm really doing a record with them. But like, for people like Migos and shit, like I, K Camp, all them, like that's my people. Like, I literally saw them. You know what I'm saying? Well, even producers too. Like Mike Will, we used to be around each other. Um, London on the track. Uh, all of us, we used to all do stuff together. So it's like, with the artists, it's like I feel like once you just work with the 16, 17, 18 years, eventually they they're the same names that we call them right now. You get mm. what I'm saying? So mm. that's why I keep going back to them instead of worrying about getting placements. Mm. Investing just, in stock early. Yeah. Yeah, because by that time, they didn't already fell in love with you. They don't want to work with nobody else. You get what I'm saying? So yeah. you're doing whole albums and stuff. That's why, like, most um, artists have a, a, a set producer 
that they only really want to work with. Like when you're in there, you're in there. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that's why I go that route instead of trying to reach for placements. The, the placements kind of come because a lot of the the dudes that got placements, they see the little dudes too, and they want to do songs with them. Mm. You know what? What should producers? How should they be making their beats right now? How how are you making beats differently, say today, than you were a year ago or two years ago? Definitely, like I said before, just like not putting a lot of stuff in the beat, just like leaving room, leaving room for the artists to say whatever they got to say. It's just with me, like my beats is mostly you know all about the eight hundred eight, and maybe like some type of melodic sound. I don't really go too far more than that, you know. And percussion, like. I really love percussion, and it might be because I'm from New Orleans too. We like a lot of percussion, and I'm I'm real happy to see that Drake song doing what it's doing. Yeah. It's not full authentic, 100% bounce music, but it's really close. Okay. But you know, it's like a lot of percussion, a fat like a little bit faster, um, and um, just don't do too much. That's what I tell yeah. you. Just don't overdo it. You yeah. know what I mean? Because a lot of times you be like, man, it's missing something. But the thing that is missing is just the artist. Yeah. It's not a sound. Makes sense. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. Lastly, man, we got the um factor, right? <clears throat> so for those of you who aren't familiar with the um factor, um, our guest has to fill up 30 seconds worth of time discussing their topic, right? And so you have to fill up the entire 30 seconds. You can't stop talking. You can't say um or ah, right? And so your topic, Garage Global, for the um factor today is excuses rappers give for being late. So to the got, studio, right? Yeah, the studio. Okay. So, so we got Daraj Global. We got the um factor. He's going to give us 30 seconds without stopping or saying um or ah, filling up the entire time, telling us about excuses rappers give for being late to the studio. Daraj Global, are you ready for the um factor? I hope so. <laughs> Let's go. My girl got off late for work, and I had to wait for her to bring the car back. <laughs> 26. My my dad. Um, oh. <laughs> that was the first actual um. Yeah, Most people man. just they were out to talk about. It was the first um yeah, we had. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, I was waiting for that. I was about to say because like the last what three or four they yeah. all passed it. So they all passed. I was thinking like it's starting to get too easy, but now we know. Nah, yeah, 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 hit me with that. Yeah, you did get my arm. <laughs> But I also was like, man, he probably heard some But stuff that first one, I, I literally heard it this week, though. <laughs> nah, for real. <laughs> yeah, that's real shit. That. <laughs> it was so real that happened this nah, week. Man. Real, yeah. So, All right, bro, before we get you out of here, man, what can we look forward to hearing from you in 2018? Hearing music wise. Uh, mm, I got another record with 21 Savage that hasn't come out yet. I got another record with Migos that hasn't come out yet. Uh, I got like, another record with Tip that hasn't come out yet. He's looking like singles or albums. I like to do singles, so I think it's gonna be singles. Okay. I think it's gonna be singles. Really, I don't understand why Kelly probably wasn't a single, but it kind of was. It seemed like every song on that album was yeah. a single because at some point they were almost all on the radio, yeah. which is amazing. Um, but you know, those three, I'm really looking forward to those records coming out. Those three records coming out this year, and I have a, a plethora of. Underground, well not underground artists, but unsigned artists that I know are gonna blow up this year. One in particular, uh, the group is called Street Capital, and the name of the song is called Johnny Gill. Oh, okay. And um, yeah, so that's what I'm looking forward to. As far as music. What style of record is that? It's the uh, you know, auto tune, uh, a lot of reverb. Is it a trap record? I wouldn't consider it trap. The artists are trap artists, but I always try to take them out of that a little bit. So it's kind of, it's commercial, but trap.